Just a brief introduction for those that are on the, on the call with us tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. This is our first uh, um, virtual meeting. Uh, we've done this several times for board meetings and it's worked out rather well. So we thought we'd give it a try just to have a general meeting and hopefully we'll get some other people to join us. And Valerie Hawkins with the uh, Emergency Planning Management Manager for Carroll County is with us tonight. And we'll be discussing all that I'm sure the county has been faced with and the actions that they've had to take, the actions that they've probably been directed to take in terms of having to deal with the COVID-19 situation. But very quickly before we start, Valerie, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you in just a moment, just as a quick update, I think our last official in-person presentation was um, in February, if I, if I recall correctly. And since that time, we haven't had any face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, we've done everything via the um, via, um, Zoom. So what um, we're planning for, and this is just planning right now because I don't know that we can commit to anything at this particular point in time, is to regroup, hopefully in person and at the library this coming September, which would be for a Board of Education candidate form or something related to the Board of Education. Uh, maybe having representatives there or a representative to discuss uh, what their plans are for the school year and how they are going to have to adapt and change to um, trying to educate uh, the students. Then October is our planned sustainable community program that was originally scheduled for April, had to be canceled obviously for COVID-19. And we're still planning to follow through with that. We had a, a pretty good plan in place. We think we um, will have an awful, uh, awfully good turnout for that on the business sector or on the business side. And uh, so that's tentatively scheduled for October, assuming that things allow us to move forward in that direction. And then November, uh, Mark Frazier uh, has done a great job over the years of providing a history night. In this particular November, it's gonna be mining in the Finksburg area. And I know Mark is uh, very diligent in doing his research and his homework and is always prepared to do an excellent presentation for that. So that's sort of our fall agenda. There is no meeting in December uh, due to the holidays. And uh, then we resume in January after that season is over. So just uh, to give an overview for everyone that's on the call with us tonight, that's what our plans are for basically the balance of the year. We don't have general meetings in uh, July and August, um, typically because it's uh, vacation time and summertime season, but there might be so many people around this year that it might make sense to try to have a meeting even if we have to do it virtually. But uh, as of right now, nothing scheduled for July and August. So with that overview about the Finksburg Planning and Citizens Council, Valerie, I'd like to turn it over to you and uh, you can give us the overview and the intelligence coming from Carroll County with regard to COVID-19. Okay, I do have a few slides. I didn't put anything fancy together. Let me see what I can do here. Uh, that isn't what I wanted to do. Try that and we'll try that. And then let me see what Zoom will let me do. I don't use Zoom very often. I'll pick that screen. Okay, did that work for you guys? It sure did, yeah, it looks All good. All right, all right, cool. Um, so obviously you guys know me. Uh, I have uh, presented to this group before. Um, you know, I'm happy to come out and uh, see you all, even if it's not in person, uh, virtual does work. It's not quite the same, but it, it, it can work in its place. Um, so I just put a few slides together and I'm hoping that we're gonna cooperate here. There we go. I have, lot, I have a couple different monitors and they're set up kind of weird and my mouse disappears on me, so bear with me. Um, just a quick overview of you know, a lot of things that uh, most people probably know or realize, some that you might not. Um, obviously, Governor, Governor Hogan declared an emergency in the state of Maryland on the 5th of March in response to COVID-19. Uh, that was when, uh, shortly after the first cases uh, had been uh, identified within the state. Uh, Carroll County, uh, did an emergency declaration the Board of County Commissioners did on the 13th of March. 
Uh, that was also the first day that, or the day that the first case in Carroll County was identified. Um, so the Carroll County state of emergency is still in effect. Uh, it was, it's currently extended through mid-July. Um, Board of County Commissioners actually decided on that this morning in open session. Um, we do have a federal major disaster declaration. Uh, the state of Maryland received that on the 26th of March. Uh, and what that means is, other than the fact that, hey, there's something big going on, because obviously there is, uh, it makes available federal assistance for uh, public assistance, which is uh, emergency protective measures, uh, basically things that uh, local governments, uh, federal government, state government, not federal, uh, county government, state government are doing uh, to keep people safe. And that can take the form of a lot of things. Uh, and we won't go into all of the detail on that, but uh, it also makes available uh, individual assistance, uh, uh, specifically for a crisis counseling program that the federal government has uh, for, uh, traditionally it's used after, uh, you know, more garden variety disasters, I guess, not pandemics, uh, for a tornado or uh, um, severe storms or a hurricane, earthquake, something like that for crisis counseling. But that's definitely something that um, you know folks are folks are having a lot of different challenges with this particular disaster. So I think it's good that uh, we have that available. Um, as of today in Carroll County, there are 1,110 cases uh, identified, 125 fatalities. Um, a lot of them are in nursing facilities. Uh, our positivity rate is 4.31%. Uh, that is actually up from 2.3, I believe it was, uh, on Tuesday. Um, so those are just the statistics today. Uh, you can always get that information from the Health Department's website. I believe I have that actual website further on in the presentation. Um, and then also the state of Maryland uh, uh, Health Department has a, a really good website, a nice dashboard. Uh, uh, Johns Hopkins has a nice dashboard. There's a lot of, of, of reputable places to uh, get data. Uh, that's why there isn't a whole lot in this presentation uh, specifically because you can find it a lot of different places. Um, you know, we've worked through a lot of different challenges since March. Um, we've there's a lot that are still ahead. Um, as I said before, the meeting actually started when we were all kind of talking, we're kind of in a little bit of a lull right now. Um, that's a good thing. And I truly hope that, you know, it stays that way. Uh, but we have to be prepared for it not to be. And uh, we need to make sure that we all stay vigilant. Uh, the governor put out a statement actually today about that, about that fact. We need to remember to stay vigilant. We need to remember to that all of the reason that we're in the situation that we are now in the positive light that we have uh, is in large part because of all of the hard work that we've all done uh, and we've all done it. So we, we definitely want to keep, keep that, uh, keep that up. Um, I put it in uh, twice. Valerie, There's the, go ahead. Valerie, can I ask a question? Sure. The state of emergency in the county until July, uh, the middle of July, um, what does that? What are those requirements, or what are the, what's the guidance around limitations or restrictions, or what's the interpretation of that emergency in Carroll County? For the state of emergency in Carroll County, it doesn't it doesn't restrict anything um, from the citizens' point of view. Uh, it's largely uh, and in a lot of ways, it's an administrative uh, fun administrative. Uh, declaration. Okay. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't go out on the roads. It doesn't mean that you can't do anything. It, uh, a lot of it has to do with activating our emergency operations plan. Uh, it also is a, a procedural thing for the, for the Board of County Commissioners. Um, and one of the things that it does too is it really sends a, a clear message from the County Commissioners that there is something serious going on in the county and that uh, you know all of the citizens of the county need to be aware of it and you know need to take action um and and this this is a different type of disaster uh as i alluded to a little bit before you know uh, a lot of the constructs that we have in place uh are built around the idea of natural disasters uh <laughs> technological disasters uh that are not pandemics that are not months long um, so we're utilizing a lot of those uh, pieces of uh, infrastructure in lots of ways that we ordinarily wouldn't have. So when people think of a state of emergency, you know, and your question kind of alludes to it, uh, people think about, okay, uh, if uh, there's a state of emergency, I shouldn't be uh, going out on the roads, I shouldn't be doing X, Y, or Z, am I allowed to? Um, in Carroll County, uh, that isn't something that the state of emergency specifically 
delineates. Now, if the Board of County Commissioners uh, wanted to do something along the lines of, you know, some of the other counties as the governor's roadmap to recovery has progressed, um, they've decided to, you know, to not progress quite as quickly because of the situation in their particular jurisdictions. Um, Baltimore County, Baltimore City, um, Howard County, Montgomery County have all, 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 and Frederick County have all done that at one point in time or another. Um, the Board of County Commissioners could do that, you know, if they decided to, uh, but that would be a separate resolution from the state of emergency. Does that make sense? Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, it, yes, it does very clearly. So as individuals, we just follow the state guidelines, basically. Right. In and, place and, right, in, now. right. In the absence of the commissioners, uh, Board of County Commissioners in Carroll County, you know, enacting anything in addition to that. No, that, that's good. Thank you, Valerie. Right. All right. So, um, with regard to emergency management, you know, that's what I do. That's what uh, my uh, responsibility is for. And we're responsible for the overall coordination of response across all of the different agencies that are involved in the response across the county to COVID-19. And I'll show you a list here in a little bit. Uh, it's actually a partial list. Um, the lead agency for this particular incident, there's always a lead agency. Um, in any incident and uh, the incident commander and the lead agency is the health department for this one because it is a public health disaster and they are the public health folks. Uh, they have the expertise, they have the knowledge uh, to do all of the, you know, to really lead the, the response. Uh, so they are our lead agency. Uh, we have been uh, in uh, the virtual format uh, at partial level in the emergency operations center. Uh, ordinarily, our emergency operations center is a, it's a place and you know, we still have that place. Uh, it's in a building and if anybody remembers uh, and was available, uh, had seen my presentation from the fall, I had a picture of the emergency operations center in there with you know, a bunch of people. You know, we all sit around in a room uh, and, and really do the coordination of response. Um, across all of the different disciplines and agencies that are involved. For this one, we're not doing it in that traditional way. We are doing it in a virtual format so that we can all stay remote. You know, the, the last thing we wanted to do uh, was to force uh, lots of people, because if we have a full, if we have an activation here, and you'll see the list of people, of agencies that are represented in our ARC on the next slide, uh, if we put all of those people in the room all together, that's definitely not practicing social distancing. Uh, it's not keeping everybody as safe as we possibly could. Uh, so we decided to activate in virtual format. So we've been utilizing uh, uh, similar to, we're not using Zoom, we're utilizing a, a different, uh, a different provider, but basically uh, the same type of teleconferencing software. Um, and we've been activated in that format since the 13th of March. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more detail about the operation uh, later on, but the, it's, it's brought challenges and it's brought successes. Uh, the, it, it, the challenges are really centered around the virtual format itself. Uh, we are blessed that we have the virtual format. We are blessed that we were able to be able, we are able to utilize it uh, to its best advantage, but it still uh, creates still a little bit of a disconnect. Uh, most of us are not used, especially at the beginning, we were definitely not used to utilizing it. So there was a learning curve there uh, with the technology itself for some people, but also uh, with just the difference in how we needed to operate the EOC itself, how we needed to do briefings, how we needed to, uh, how we needed to, you know, set up the scheduling, scheduling so that it's uh, most effective, uh, a lot of those types of things. Um, we have had a lot of successes. Uh, we have proven that we're able to do this. We had actually talked about it before uh, this ever happened. Uh, we had talked about possibly utilizing a, a virtual format for things like, uh, like uh, blizzards or so maybe not the rising to a blizzard, but a, a winter storm where we're activated, we're paying attention, we're monitoring things in the county. There's some level of additional coordination that needs to take place, but it's not really to the point where we need to have people staying overnight at the EOC. Um, so we had talked about that. I said, well, we're not really sure whether that would work or not. Uh, and we tried it now and we know that we can make it work if we need to. 
you know, so it is, it's, it's another tool in the toolbox that we know can work if we need to, if we need to bring it out. Um, it's not the, uh, it's definitely still not the preferred method of EOC operations. Um, and many of the other uh, EOCs around the state, uh, some have done a hybrid, some have done in person. Uh, many of them, or I would say the majority of them have it, had at least a, 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 a portion of their operations go to virtual. Uh, and we, you know, it, it, with varying degrees of success, <laughs> it just, just depends on the jurisdiction. We're all, we all have a little bit different uh, personality. I said, uh, yes, so, uh, Martin, do you have a question? Oh uh, yeah, well, I'm a teacher. And so we had to do all the same switch over to online teaching, exactly the same problems of, can we make this work, but we need to make it work and so on. So what you described is just what we did with uh, teaching as well. Yeah, I, I think that uh, many, uh, many places, at, uh, not places, um, many disciplines, many, uh, many organizations have had to do that had had to do similar things you know and uh i think that we've uh in some cases we've surprised ourselves <laughs> um, yeah. in other cases you know maybe you know people were a lot more comfortable with it but uh like i said it, it is a nice tool to have in the toolbox to know that we can do it if we need to and you know my, my personal guess is we'll probably we're probably going to need to do it in multiple ways in moving into the future for this event still as well as for others so. Well, right. And having started doing it, we are now kind of, now we have family meetings and club meetings and, and here we're having think packs. So, you know, so we're expanding its use. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, one of the good things too is, uh, you know, having the internet, you know, just having the internet in general, having that available to all, to the majority of people, it's, you know, it, it's not available to every single person, but uh, this would have been a completely different event uh, so far if the internet hadn't existed. So. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, uh, getting back to the, the, the is, do, I, do you have another question or I don't want to skip over anything. Okay. Um, you know, we do participate in regular briefing calls with the Maryland Emergency Management Agency, uh, as, as well as the Baltimore Urban Area Security Initiative or the UAC region. Um, they started, uh, every week they've actually started to wind down a little bit now the EOC at the state level has been activated since uh, since March as well so getting into a little bit more about our EOC and uh, the coordination that we've been doing uh, we have agency representatives on our calls from the health department you know, obviously they're the lead agency uh, Carroll Hospital uh, we've been working closely and coordinating with the hospital uh, we only have one hospital in our county one receiving hospital uh, other jurisdictions uh, certainly have many more than we do, and that's a little bit more coordination that needs to be done for them, but you know, we, we only have one. Uh, with Fire and Rescue and EMS through the Carroll County Volunteer Emergency Services Association, uh, law enforcement, uh, all of the and law enforcement agencies across the county, so the Sheriff's Office, the State Police, all of the town police departments, uh, and then also Carroll Community College and McDaniel Campus Safety. Um, Carroll Community College and McDaniel, especially McDaniel, uh, they had some, you know, they had issues to work around with regard to uh, students that were on campus that needed to be moved off of campus eventually. And there for a while, it, we, it was kind of in that uh, in-between stage where, uh, you know, the guidance changed a lot uh, and it still continues to change, just not quite as quickly. But they, you know, they, they had that transition period of, of moving students off campus uh, they sent everybody home and then uh, they had to work out a plan and coordinate it with all of the other agencies uh, to assist to get the students back to get their belongings when it was decided that they weren't going to have in-person classes the rest of the year. Um, so there's a lot of moving pieces that have been uh, going uh, with, uh, with those agencies. Um, our Department of Public Works is represented on those calls. Uh, they have been helping us uh, significantly with resource management. We'll talk a little bit more about the kind of resources we've been managing on the next slide. Uh, our Department of Citizen Services uh, and Social Services, uh, working with, uh, a lot of that has been working with um, homeless uh, individuals uh, for citizen services. Um, as you can imagine, if you're homeless, uh, you don't have access, ready access to soap and water. You don't have ready access to a place to wash your hands. Um, it's, if you do happen to get sick, it's kind of, it's in some ways it's difficult to, uh, to self-isolate, uh, depending on your particular situation. Uh, so they've been working through a lot of those challenges. Um, 
Department of Social Services has been working on the uh, coordinated coordination of some feeding activities. Uh, they've uh, kind of they've set up a, a hotline and a uh, a website so that if people are if people are in need of food, they can call social services and you know get connected to uh, ways to to get food. Um, public schools, uh, obviously, they've uh, they've been quite busy as well. Uh, making a huge transition from in-person to uh, uh, virtual. And also uh, they have done a lot of feeding. Uh, they have done a lot of meal distribution for uh, kids who would ordinarily, you know, be receiving uh, uh, lunches and breakfasts at school. Uh, they've been doing a huge amount of uh, meal distribution. Uh, the, our Department of Information Technology, uh, as we mentioned, uh, they have been highly involved in uh, keeping all of our technology straight uh, because county government uh, sent as many people on to telework as possible uh, and getting all of that set up, like for people who ordinarily uh, wouldn't do that, uh, had to add in uh, had it add in laptops, extra laptops into the equation, extra webcams, extra sets of headsets, all of the other things that go along with uh, needing to work virtually. Um, and then, you know, dealing uh, with, uh, you know, the, there's a lot more utilization of our network, you know, just more people uh, on our network from uh, the outside. Uh, you know, coming in, you know, and there's uh, all sorts of background work that has to be done to make sure that's done in a safe manner uh, from the cybersecurity standpoint. Uh, so that's been some challenges. Uh, our Office of Communications, uh, our uh, public information officer has, is represented on the EOC calls. Uh, they've done a lot of work uh, with getting uh, consistent and accurate and reliable information out to people uh, about the situation. Um, and about actions to be taken, uh, resources, all of those kind of things. Um, the Maryland Emergency Management Agency is on our calls, so that's uh, so we're coordinating horizontally across the county and all of the different agencies that are represented in the county. But we're also coordinating up to MEMA uh, as well, and then to the region uh, with the Baltimore area UAC region. Um, we started out with twice daily calls. And uh, now we're meeting uh, virtually weekly and as needed. Um, as I said, we're kind of, you know, moving into a lull. A lot of the things that uh, we had to kind of create on the fly uh, at the beginning are now running, they're working. And uh, so there isn't uh, quite as heavy a lift on the coordination piece because we've all got our individual things and we're kind of chugging along uh, and uh, things are, uh, going you know pretty well as well as can be expected so there isn't quite that heavy a lift for the you know for the the coordination on a daily basis or a twice daily basis um, so that's just a, a smattering of the agency representatives and the types of activities that we're coordinating uh, our role is to really bring everybody together in that format so that all of those agency representatives can you know basically report out uh, discuss any needs that they might have, uh, discuss uh, activities that they've got going on so that we can deconflict them across the county so that we're not duplicating services because we certainly don't want to do that and so that we can make sure that the response is as efficient as it possibly can be. So I'll stop for a second. Any questions on any of that? Mallory, that's a very comprehensive and demanding list of uh, coordination aspects that you have to deal with there for sure. Um, any, any sense as to how Carroll County is performing against the rest of the state in general? I know the hot spots, you know, Montgomery County, Prince George's County, they are sort of, I think, still leading the pack in terms of, of cases and the challenges that they have there. But uh, for the balance of the, the state, um, it would seem like we're doing probably better than most. I, I, I don't know. That's my sense of it, just trying to watch the, the crawls across the news uh, uh, programs at night whenever they look at the tallies and the, the number of um, committed cases and that sort of thing. Right. Um, you know, when you, look at the, when you look at it from a statistical point, you know, our, our case numbers are not extraordinarily high um, compared to some of the other jurisdictions. Um, and there, there could be a lot of reasons for that. 
right? Um, I think that a lot of the reason that we have uh, had, you know, the success that we have in keeping as many people healthy as we have is, you know, we, we have, uh, number one, we have a pretty self-reliant community uh, in Carroll County. Uh, we're pretty resilient altogether. Uh, we're resilient in the face of many disasters. Uh, and we have people, you know, the, in general, the community is willing to do what it takes to, to help each other out and keep everybody safe. Uh, I think that is a, a big portion of it. Um, we have good leadership at the health department. Um, we have we have a strong health department, uh, and we have from from an EOC operations standpoint. You know, I I can speak from my seat in the house to this piece. We work really hard uh, fr from the emergency management perspective, but all of the other agencies work hard at this too, to maintain the relationships, to build and maintain the relationships bet during uh, non-disaster times between all of these agencies. We meet. Uh, the majority of all of these agencies, we meet monthly anyway. Uh, we meet the first Wednesday of every month at a, you know, we have a, uh, like a tactical planning meeting um, so that we build those relationships. We maintain them so that we already know each other. Um, in some larger jurisdictions, you know, it, it, it might be a little bit more difficult to, to keep that up just because you've got more players, right? You've got more agencies, you've got more staff to deal with. Um, you know, we're blessed in Carroll County that we have a really high level of collaboration uh, amongst all of these different agencies. And I truly think that that makes a big difference with regard to, uh, with regard to response. Uh, and then also, you know, that, that trickles down to, uh, you know, to what the, what the average citizen might see. Very good. Very good. So I, I, uh, in a lot of my presentations, I'll, I have one a slide that says emergency management equals relationships. That's really what emergency management is. <laughs> okay. Um, I said I'd talk a little bit about resource management. Um, that's a, a, a large portion of what we've been doing in emergency management for this particular event. Um, we've been working with uh, the state um, uh, as you've probably heard on the news, uh, the uh, State Department of Health uh, has, uh, and MEMA at, at, the, at the state level, they have purchased an awful lot of PPE. Uh, the federal government has provided PPE, which is personal protective equipment. So, you know, masks, gowns, gloves, face shields, uh, all of those other kinds of uh, uh, personal protective items. Um, but uh, our agency is uh, in coordination with our Department of Public Works, we are the lead for sourcing those things, uh, warehousing them, and also getting them distributed to the agencies that need them. So uh, that is, as you can imagine, uh, just from probably watching some of the news coverage, that's a, that's a big lift. Um, it's not something that uh, our agency does on this scale. I mean, none of our agencies have done it on the scale that we're doing it. Um, so that has been a definite learning process, uh, but that's one of those things where we got a system up and running, uh, it's working and it's, it's moving right along. So it took a while to, to, to get it that, that way and get, that, get it established, but um, we took the, the constructs that we had in place to, for a more traditional disaster and tweaked them and then put them into place uh, to bring to bear on this one. Um, we're also uh, the agency that deals with uh, like other material that might be required for response. So in a traditional disaster, uh, we may be called upon to try to find uh, a specific piece of heavy equipment to move debris from a collapsed building, something like that. That's uh, one of the, you know, one of our roles is to try to, to do that sourcing and uh, bring to bear the resources that are needed to uh, take care of whatever disaster we're dealing with. Um, for this one, uh, it's been a little bit different. Uh, a lot of it has been PPE um, thermometers. Uh, that's something that uh, has been in, in uh, large demand. Um, up until a few weeks ago, uh, we were working closely with uh, the child care providers. Um, uh, a lot of different agencies that we ordinarily wouldn't have been working with, uh, we have been. So that's been a little bit of an adjustment. Um, a good one. We've been able to build some more relationships that we ordinarily wouldn't have been able to. Um, 
So we do that coordination between you know, the local agencies to Carroll County Emergency Management. Uh, so uh, for example, um, the Sheriff's Office needs, uh, they've identified a need for gowns. Uh, you know, they're, they're out of gowns from their supply and they need some more. Well, they reach out to us and we find it uh, either through our warehousing or uh, we go out and we source it and we get it to them. Um, if we can't source something in the uh, county, we can reach out to the state. So basically we go up to the next level and request it from MEMA and then MEMA looks to see if they can find it. Um, so it's, it's, we're doing things with non, non-traditional uh, request stores as well as non-traditional items. Uh, none of us are used to dealing with uh, large amounts of PPE, for example. We're not used to ordering PPE in, in giant sized amounts. Uh, and that's what we're ending up having to do and then trying to figure out places to put it and uh, effective ways to distribute it and all of those types of things. But uh, we, we have, uh, all, all of the people that have been involved have done a good job. We've been creative and we figured out how to, how to accomplish it. Um, we've worked uh, with uh, public information. Uh, we have something called a joint information center is set up. Uh, in most disasters, that's the case. There is a joint information center. Uh, and the joint information center is really set up so that all of the, in, in our, uh, this particular disaster for us, uh, the main agencies, the, the, so the school system, the health department, uh, county government, sheriff's office, uh, all of the public information officers from those agencies, the Joint Information Center is, uh, we're doing that virtually as well. But that's another construct that allows us to uh, coordinate the messaging so that uh, you're not getting, you know, the intent is, and I think we've done a reasonably good job, that you're not getting uh, one message from one agency and then if you go to somebody else's website, you're getting something different. Uh, because that's not what we want to have happen in a disaster. We want all of the, you know, we want people to have the correct information all at the same time, if we, if we can possibly arrange it, but we, we want it to be a consistent and coordinated message. So uh, the Joint Information Center uh, works similarly to the Emergency Operations Center, uh, where we're uh, working virtually uh, to, to issue some joint press releases. Uh, there have been several that have gone out with the health department and the county uh, co-logoed. Uh, but then also the, uh, the school system and the sheriff's office and the hospital, uh, we all work together to make sure that information is correct and uh, we're all sending it out at about the same time. Um, we are working through the public assistance uh, uh, reimbursement process, as I mentioned at the beginning uh, of the presentation. Uh, we do have a public as a disaster declaration for public assistance uh, in the county. And then uh, everybody's heard about the CARES Act uh, funding that uh, has been passed down from the federal government. Um, so we are in, uh, involved in, uh, in that piece of things. And we, we always are involved in public assistance uh, uh, reimbursement for blizzards, for whatever other disaster we might have come down the pike. Um, and then, you know, we really function as a liaison between all of the different agencies and between the, lo the, the local agencies, excuse me, uh, both uh, county agencies and municipal agencies, because we do work with the towns. Uh, and then, you know, the state and the federal level. So, you know, we, we really try to be that liaison piece to get information back and forth. Uh, a lot of it is coming in this disaster specifically is coming down from the state uh, and being distributed out to the, to the local jurisdictions and then the, the municipalities. Um, the, uh, uh, it's a lot more state heavy uh, in this one than it has been in uh, other disasters. But I think that in this particular disaster, there probably isn't any other way to run it effectively because it's, it's spread across such a wide geographical area. You know, it's not just, you know, it's not just a few counties that had three feet of snow. Um, it's uh, in order to coordinate it effectively. I, I do think that the, you know, that the state, uh, the state taking that lead role has made a big difference in uh, how the response has gone. You know, there's there's never going to be a there's never going to be a perfect way to to deal with a pandemic, and uh, none of us have ever dealt with one in any of our careers. Uh, and I sincerely hope that this is the only one that I ever have to deal with. Um, but um, it's it, it's been a challenge, and 
try and to, to learn and uh, grow through it. Um, we are work. I'm sorry. No, I, I, I understand, completely understand. I mean, it, it had to be overwhelming, certainly at the outset, just to try to understand where you have to turn to and who you have to speak with and all of the coordination. And you point out many times about the relationships, I mean, vitally important in terms of trying to organize uh, an effort such as this. Yeah. Barry, if I could ask a question, this is Mark Frazier. Certainly. Uh, all the agencies that you interact with and coordinate, I noticed economic development wasn't on there and they've been giving various grants, to small businesses. And how do you coordinate with that? They, um, we do, we do coordinate and communicate with them. Um, they are not a traditional, uh, EOC representative. Uh, they are not a traditional agency that's represented in the EOC. Right. Um, they are an agency that is, in a traditional disaster, they are one of the lead agencies for recovery. So in a traditional disaster, in any disaster, you know, you have the response phase and you work through the response phase and then you work into recovery. Um, and we've kind of got one foot in each one of those places right now. Um, so economic development in a traditional disaster is really heavy in the recovery phase. And that's what they're doing. Um, you know, that's, they're trying to, you know, to help businesses recover. They're trying to get information out. And we have worked with them uh, throughout this. Uh, the Department of Commerce at the state level has put out a lot of information. They've passed that through um, to, uh, to the community. So on the, on the uh, communication side and the information uh, uh, dissemination piece, you know, we have worked with them to make sure that, you know, if, if, if we have information about something that could help the business community, we, you know, we push it over to them and then they can push it out to, you know, to the, because they, they are the, you know, they, they are the best route for us to get information out to, to, to that audience. So um, they're, they're not on that particular EOC list, uh, but they, they are definitely involved in the process. Absolutely. That, You're that welcome. answered the question. Thank yep, you. Absolutely. Yeah, and I apologize. I normally have a uh, a better presentation for when I do presentations, uh, my my PowerPoint slides, but I just didn't just didn't have the didn't have the time to to get in, into as much detail as I probably would have otherwise. Um, the testing site at the Ag Center. I'm sure that you all have heard about that. Uh, that is being run uh, by the Carroll County Health Department, but we were involved and still are involved uh, in uh, pro uh, providing uh, traffic management um, and just uh, liaison work. Uh, that's running pretty well. They've got it uh, up three days now. So Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday, uh, you can uh, go and get tested at the Ag Center. Um, that's also, uh, also involves the, the State Department of Health as well. So uh, that was a uh, that was a bit of a challenge to get going, but once again, it's one of those things. At the beginning, it's a little bit of a heavier lift, and now it's running and it's working well. Um, so it's not quite as uh, resource intensive. Uh, we did have the, and you probably saw the uh, the newspaper coverage about it. Uh, the Ag Center uh, was evaluated by the Army Corps of Engineers uh, for a uh, alternate care site. You know, for uh, ex uh, actual patient care um you know luckily and i have to knock on some wood you know that's not something that uh that we needed to that we needed to pursue uh, uh anywhere around the state uh except for you know the the you know baltimore the baltimore uh, metropolitan region and then uh you know down towards dc um there are a few of those but um we did have that site visit and all of the coordination. Uh, that's one of the examples of coordinating up to the federal level uh, with the state and the local. And uh, uh, it was our responsibility to keep, to keep that coordination and that communication uh, between all those agencies going, which was challenging um, just because of the number of people involved in that. Um, we are working on a resource portal uh, that's going to be coming soon as part of our recovery uh, process. Uh, I can't give you a date on that, but the whole idea behind that is to have one place 
uh, where we can uh, direct people to say for any information that you're looking for, for the recovery from COVID and continuing response to COVID-19, uh, go to this particular place and you'll be able to link to uh, all sorts of different resources. So if you uh, need resources for housing or you need uh, a link to uh, all the executive orders and any of the changing guidance, um, if you need links to the health department, if you need uh, information about, you know, about the grants that economic development has uh, going on, all of those different places, it's intended to be a one-stop shop uh, so that it makes it a lot easier and it'll basically be a, a kind of like a, a hub and spoke approach uh, to get information out there uh, because even through recovery, you know, getting your information from those trusted sources is still really, really important. Um, uh, we certainly are uh, going to need to do continued social distancing measures. Um, that's something that I think we're going to all be living with for, for quite a while. Uh, it's just our reality, uh, whether we whether we like it or enjoy it or not. Um, you know, that's that's just what we what we need to do to keep everybody safe. Um, one of the 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 kind of neat things that's coming out of this particular response is the formation of the Carroll County COAD. Uh, and COAD stands for County Organizations Active in Disaster. Um, some of you may be may have heard of uh, the Maryland VOAD or the National VOAD, which is Voluntary Agencies Active in Disaster. That's what that stands for. Uh, but basically, uh, the the uh, there's a group in Eldersburg that had uh, start in the Freedom Area that had started uh, kind of looking to do like. Uh, uh, organization of some pop-up pantries and uh, things like that uh, and they realized that it pro there was a lot of activity going on and it, they made it made sense to try to bring another level of coordination to that um, so they reached that they had some uh, uh, connections with Howard County and Howard County uh, just over the past couple of years put together uh, their own co-ed uh, so that's uh, where they uh, got some of their information, but we're working with them uh, to put that together. And that is not a county government agency. It is a separate, uh, separate agency. Uh, the whole idea behind a COAD or a VOAD of any description is to um, uh, prevent duplication of effort and uh, promote coordination across the voluntary agency response in a disaster. Because in most disasters of uh, large size, the voluntary agencies like uh, you know, Red Cross, Salvation Army, uh, Southern Baptists, uh, Seventh-day Adventists, uh, um, uh, um, Meals on Wheels. Uh, and, I mean, I could go down the list. There's, there's list after list of, of organizations that have uh, a disaster response mission. Um, that are voluntary organizations. Um, but the whole idea is to make sure that as all of them respond to a disaster, that there isn't, you know, to try to decrease the level of overlap and increase the level of organization and coordination amongst all of them to pr bring about the most effective use of resources and effective response. So uh, that's something that is, uh, that is coming out of this. Um, and I think it'll be a, a you know, a great benefit uh, later on down the down the road into the future, um, it's it's in its infancy right now, uh, but it is something that's uh, that's really that's really pretty neat. Um, we will be doing an after action review of this particular uh, event. Uh, we always do that after any response. So if you remember back in February, we had a tornado in Westminster. Uh, we had uh, the county office building had a uh, hazardous materials event. Uh, we have. Uh, done after action reviews of those. So basically it's an opportunity for lessons learned uh, to figure out what went right, what went wrong, uh, figure out how we can make things better in the future. Um, this particular event is gonna be a little bit different uh, to do an after action review because we're really gonna end up doing an after action review before the event's over with. Uh, because if we don't do that, then uh, we're going to probably run the risk of um, losing some of that uh, some of that immediate uh, I, um, identification of issues. You know, you get further out into the future, and somebody might not remember what went you know, something that really mattered at the time, and it really does matter overall, but it just kind of slips through the cracks. So 
we're going to try to to come up with a way to do an after action review process uh, as we're still responding in some way. So we're just gonna have to segment it, but that'll be something that's completely different. We've never done it that way before, uh, but you know, we'll, we'll have a template for the future if we ever need to do it again once we're done. Uh, and then uh, we're still gonna need to work on uh, pub, uh, PPE sourcing and warehousing. Uh, that's not gonna go away. Um, especially as we get into the fall, you know, we are concerned about the possibility of uh, a resurgence in COVID-19 uh, at the same time as an active flu season. Um, so it's not like necessarily people would have both diseases at the same time, uh, but the, the stress on the healthcare system uh, is uh, of significant concern there. And obviously we don't wanna have extra people sick. We wanna keep, the, keep people as safe as we possibly can. So those are just some of the things that um, our office is going to be working on uh, into the future. Um, that, I mean, this is not the, if I was to go over everything that all of county government has been doing, we would be here until tomorrow morning. There are so many things going on. Um, and, you know, certainly if you all have any questions, um, go ahead and you know ask them and i'll and i'll address them as best i can uh it's just it's 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 difficult to distill just what our office is doing into you know a succinct package um so it's really difficult to do it for the county um just one thing i do want to bring up um you know as we move into this path to recovery and we're working through the governor's roadmap to recovery uh people really need to be thinking about, you know, you need to make some adjustments to your emergency kits and your emergency plans for yourself and your family. Um, just because we're in the middle of a COVID-19 response doesn't mean that all of the other types of disasters stop. Um, we have severe storms. Uh, hurricane season started on June 1st. Um, we're up to four storms named already. Um, luckily, they haven't, uh, you know, really affected as much, but it only takes one storm to really make a big, a big difference. Um, for emergency kits, uh, you know, you need to think about adding uh, things to help with uh, social distancing and sanitation, excuse me. So, you know, face coverings, you know, make sure in your uh, emergency supplies kit, you've got, a, you know, got a few masks, you know, cloth face coverings, uh, whatever you're most comfortable with, hand sanitizer, um, things like that, that uh, you would need uh, in a, a, to help to keep yourself uh, more comfortable and safe uh, in, a, in a sheltering situation or if you just need to be uh, for, some, for whatever reason, you, you know, they're, they're handy things to have. Um, you, know, you need to think about reviewing your evacuation and sheltering in place plans uh, because the needs of social distancing and possibly isolation and quarantine might necessitate some changes. So for example, if your evacuation plan, uh, if you did need to evacuate your home would be to stay with relatives that are nearby, but those relatives are high risk uh, for COVID-19 or perhaps they, you know, somebody is ill and they're in isolation or quarantine situation, uh, you need to think about, all right, well, what's my backup plan? Where else can I go? Uh, those types of things. And I mean, this is just touching, touching uh, the tip of the iceberg. Um, but, you know, disaster sheltering in general will look different in the light of a pandemic. Um, it's possible that we, you know, if we had some large disaster, we would still need to set up a, you know, a congregate disaster shelter. Um, but there are significant challenges with keeping people socially distanced and safe in a disaster sheltering environment. So and we're in the process along with the state of working through some of those questions and trying to come up with you know with reasonable answers uh to to kind of to, to walk the line of figuring out how to you know we still have to keep people safe from whatever disaster has occurred but we also need to keep uh the environment safe uh in which they're they're staying so uh, there's some huge challenges on the horizon there So that is the end of my slides. Um, you know, any questions that you all have, I'm more than happy to, to answer if I can. If I can't, uh, I'll find out the answers for you and uh, email Skip back so that you guys have them. Um, hope I didn't bore you. <laughs> no, not, not at all, Valerie. Thank you very much. That was, uh, I'm sure in your world, it, it's an, a very much abbreviated presentation with all that you have going on. 
but from my view, at least in particular, it was very comprehensive and all inclusive of, of uh, at least a broad description of everything that's taking place and you're trying to deal with. Uh, just one question, in, um, in the heat of battle, and, and I guess we're through, or at least we hope we're through the worst of it right now within the county, um, did the, uh, how, how about the services at the hospital? Or how taxed were they? Or were they able to manage through all of the challenges, uh, I, I guess at a reasonable pace? I'm not sure how to ask that question, but I don't think that I heard anything in terms of extreme stress or challenges from uh, service coming out of the hospital. Yeah, my um, my understanding of all uh, of their situation, uh, they were definitely busy. They were definitely extra busy in in some ways, um, and it, it's it's a little bit. Um, it can be a little bit misleading because as you've heard, a lot of people kind of put off going to the hospital unless they absolutely had to. Mm -hmm. So some, uh, some things that you would think maybe would be higher like emergency room visits weren't necessarily the case. So, you know, emergency room visits were a little bit lower sometimes, uh, but the, uh, the stress on the uh, intensive care units uh, was higher. So, you know, the, the acuity of the patients that they were dealing with in a lot of ways was stressful. And when we had uh, the, uh, especially with the incident uh, revolving around the nursing homes, uh, and uh, the, those were extraordinarily stressful times um, for the, the hospital, for the health department, uh, because uh, at that point in time, uh, you know, the, especially the, you know, the, the intensive care units, you know, they were working on their expanded capacities. You know, they, they weren't ever, um, there wasn't ever a point in time where they could, where they couldn't sit, where they couldn't accept, you know, an additional patient in. We didn't run up against that. Um, but they, you know, they were utilizing the, the plans they had, that they had put in place to, to expand, you know, their, their capacity for some of those things. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the hospital had, you know, has put in a lot of uh, a lot of planning uh, and a lot of prepared uh, preparation uh, for for the event. You know they they've done a very you know a, a thoughtful job, uh, and uh, you know, I, I give them a lot of credit for that. They they have a difficult challenge. Valerie, do you know did they have adequate ventilators for this emergency? Our hospital did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So um, I have an item, it's not so much a question, but just sort of a request for information going forward, perhaps. Um, so we get uh, reports on the total numbers for different counties and the different zip codes. Um, but uh, some of those totals, they're always going to keep, that kind of total is always going to keep going up. And um, some of those are from like March and April, which are completed by now one way or the other. I would love to see reporting, which was more like what, how, what's the number of new cases in the last two or three weeks because that would then give us a feel for how active is it in our area and I know okay. you're not in charge of, of all reporting <laughs> but um, that would be a, a great thing to know because it kind of gives me a feel for what's going on and, and the other way I see the reporting is um, instead of just numbers of cases of, of course the Westminster zip code is going to have more than the Finksburg zip code because there's more people in Westminster so if they could be reported as per capita sort of uh, rates, kind of like the positivity rates, so they're adjusted for that. And again, that's another way to get a feel for how uh, how is my community doing in, in that way. So right, so I, yeah. I, I know a lot of that. Some of that can be cranked into the GIS and into the the dashboards and so forth, and it can do those calculations really easily if it's just set up that way. So that'd be uh, lovely. Again, I know you're not in charge of all the reporting from the state and so forth. Yeah, I, I can pass it on to the health department. Um, they they put their own statistics up um, on their website, uh, and they do uh, list day by day. They'll do you know, but right. I, I know I know you're looking for more of a trend over a week. Um, and then with regard to the per capita, I mean, I can ask the health department to see if they can you know if they can do something along those lines. Uh, you know, even, even if it's just on, on the local website, you know, and, and I can pass it on to the state and see, and see, you know, whether they can add that in there or not. Okay. Thank you. It just kind of gives a better uh -huh. feel for uh, what's going on. 
Yeah, and you know the zip code, it, the zip code data is nice to have, uh, but one thing we all have to remember too is that our zip codes don't respect county borders. <laughs> yeah. So when you look at the zip code for you know for Sykesville, for example, well, part of that's Howard County. So you really have to keep in mind that you know, and, and on uh, you know this side, your all side of the world, you know, you bleed over into Baltimore County on some of the zip codes. So uh, it's 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 better that it's it's more granular than just the county data, but you know you have to you have to understand what you're actually looking at when you're looking at that data. But I can pass Thank along you. those those ideas. Well, this is Diana Frazier. Um, how compliant has the community been in your your opinion? Um, do you feel like now that some of the restrictions have been released, do you feel like people are um, just starting to ignore some of the uh, precautions that they originally were taking, or or what's your what's your feeling on that? Um. I think that in general, as we've moved through, you know, Carroll County has been, you know, people have been pretty compliant um, so far. Uh, there haven't been a huge number of uh, calls for, for example, for law enforcement uh, to respond to, uh, you know, to to any issues with regard to, to people being uh, non-compliant with any of the executive orders. There have been a few. Uh, they've been out there. Um, it is truly a concern of mine uh, as we move forward and people you know, become a little bit more complacent, uh, that you know the, they'll they'll kind of let their guard down, and really, truthfully, I do believe that the reason that we're in such a good such a good place as we are, obviously, it's not the place we want to be, but it's it's definitely a good place so far, is because of all of the actions that people have taken, and and it's and it's very important for people to keep you know to keep that up. Um, so as of this time, haven't seen too many issues with people being non-compliant. Um, I, I, obviously none of us know what the future holds. Uh, I hope that people still remain compliant with that because I think it, it's, it's to all of our benefit. Uh, but I, you know, I certainly understand. I think we all do. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it, it does wear on you you know, all of the different changes that you have to make to your daily life. And, and it, it is, it is a challenge. Uh, but um, as of this time, we haven't had much of an issue with, uh, with non-compliance. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Uh-huh. I have a question. Sure. Go ahead. Hi, this is Ann Boyle, Skip's wife. Hi. Um, hi. Thank you very much, Valerie. That was very informative. Um, I have two questions, actually. You mentioned the um, citizenship group that deals with the homeless people. Is that the Department of Citizen Services? Yes, Citizen Services. Um, I just was wondering about that, how the homeless people were addressed during the brunt of the pandemic. Um, were they provided with any PPE equipment like hand sanitizer, face mask? And also, um, I know they had drive-through testing. Were there any ambulatory sites set up for testing for the homeless? Um, a lot of the, well, the testing one is, is a little bit more straightforward to answer. Um, there wasn't any, there weren't any like walk-up sites uh, for testing, but uh, the, um, they would, they were handling that on a case by case basis. So if, uh, if, a, if a homeless, if an individual who's experiencing homeless needed to be tested, uh, they were, uh, you know, we were dealing with that on a case by case basis and figuring out the best way to accomplish it so that uh, the test, a lot of the time, you know, maybe the test could be brought to them or they could be transported to where they needed to, to be tested. Um, with regard to, you know, to PPE and, uh, hand sanitizer things like that um there have been things there have been things put in place to assist with that so uh um just as an example um some uh, uh hand washing stations uh you know placed in uh near uh known encampments uh to allow for uh people to you know you know, if you're living in an encampment in a tent, possibly you don't necessarily have running water. You don't have any place, any way to wash your hands. So that was one way to try to help increase uh, opportunities for sanitation. Uh, and and there were some other uh, you know PPE items that were you know that were that were distributed out to try to try to help keep the that population safe. And there is a a, a day center operating uh, in Westminster um, at the Westminster Senior Center. 
uh, for, uh, for, for folks experiencing homeless. So they had some place to, you know, some place to go during the day uh, to, and it's still operating to, um, you know, wash hands, uh, get resources, you know, informational as well. Um, so uh, there, there have been, uh, there have been resources out there for, for that particular segment of the population. And I'm assuming Access Care has probably been involved in this as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, and there's uh, they they Access Carol has been uh, a partner with uh, uh, Citizen Services uh, on uh, a couple different initiatives to 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 work through a lot of a lot of these challenges. Okay, thank you. And my other my other um, it's just a comment. I was wondering if um, because it seems like so many of the urgent care centers are propping up in the county. I was wondering if you think that may have taken some of the brunt away from the emergency room. Has that been helpful to the emergency room? Have there been, um, have, I don't know if you keep track of any of that, if there's been an influx in the cases that are arriving at the urgent care centers with symptoms. That one, I don't know, uh, because I don't, I don't really have access to any of that particular data. Um, I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I can ask. Uh, I can ask the health department if they know. Um, That's they, right. I was just curious to see if that was if if that's been discussed at all. Because I I know you said there hasn't been you know the emergency room's been able to handle the um, influx of cases. But I was just curious to know if urgent care is taking over for some of that for the ER, which is which would be good. So. I know we don't want the emergency room to be, you know, overrun with uh, virus cases. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't, I just don't have the the deep the that particular data for you. I apologize. No, that's okay. Just curious. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. And any other questions, Martin, Mike, Diana, Mark? No, oh, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Such that I am. Okay. Well, Valerie, I want to thank you again for joining us once again and providing um, your updates and overview about all the activity and action that's taking place in the county. That's uh, it's a daunting task. I mean, no doubt. I mean, this is extraordinary. Everything that we're going through at this moment in time, and you're certainly in a role that's at the forefront of that. So. Thank you, not only for the presentation, but thank you for the effort that you put into your job every day, you and the department and everybody else, and trying to keep us educated, informed, and safe. It's uh, vitally important, and thank you for a job well done. Well, thank you. I definitely appreciate, you know, definitely appreciate the opportunity to come out. Well, I'm not coming out and talking yeah. to you, but uh, coming and talking to you. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is as good as it gets for now, and we appreciate your time tonight. We really do. All right. Well, thank you. And um, everybody, make sure you stay safe. And if you have okay. any questions, if you do have any questions that come up, you know, Skip, you've got my email address, you know, email me yep. and I'll do my best to answer them for you. Great. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, All Valerie. right. Okay. Well, I'll All go right. ahead and drop off and you guys have an enjoyable meeting. Okay. I think we're about to close. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks. Okay, Martin, thank you very much.